then we provided a conditional use permit for <laughs> Good evening, everybody. Today is February 21st, Tuesday, uh, for our regular Moscow City Council meeting. President Bowen? Would you all join me in saying the Pledge of Allegiance? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you, Jim. The first thing on the agenda will be the consent agenda. Oh, well, before we start on the consent agenda, I got an announcement. We will not be having an executive session this evening. Okay, with that, I'll move on to the consent agenda. John. I would uh, move that we accept the consent, <coughs> accept the consent agenda as written. I'll second that. Okay, we've got a motion by John and a second by Gina to approve the consent agenda as it is written. I'll start the roll with Walter. Aye. 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 Okay. We will move on to the next thing, which is staff recognition uh, report. Gary Reedner, you have the podium, sir. Thank you, Your Honor. Uh, we don't have any specific uh, employees to recognize tonight. However, I just wanted to take a moment again. Uh, we've had, in the last couple of weeks, we've gone from ice and snow, and want to thank the city crews, the uh, Parks and Rec Department, Street Department, and everybody who helped out, as well as the volunteers, uh, for the help in removing that. We had a flood event uh, last week that uh, we also had a lot of help from staff members and community members, as well as the Moscow Volunteer Fire Department. Uh, my understanding is the creek is on the rise again. Hopefully it won't reach the stage where we have another flood event, but if so, our people are prepared to deal with that as well. But just wanted to give those folks a little bit of recognition. Thank you. Gary, the crew has done a really terrific job this uh, winter. It's been a brutal winter for all of us, and uh, they all, everybody needs to be committed with the street worm has worked on that. So thank, thank you. you. Okay, item number three, mayoral's appointment, and I have one this evening. Uh, before the council, and that is an appointment for a board of adjustment seat to Stephen Bush with an expiration date of 12 31 2019. I would entertain a motion. I move that we accept the appointment of Steve Bush to the board of adjustment. Second. Okay, we've got a motion by Catherine and a second by John to approve uh, Steve Bush on the board of adjustments. I'll start the roll with you, John. Aye. 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 And I. Okay. The next item is uh, public comment and uh, Mayor Royal's response. I allow 15 minutes for this. Um, you know, as long as it is something that is not on this evening's agenda or something that is in front of the Board of Adjustment and or the Planning and Zoning, uh, you can come up front here and at the podium state your name, address, and let us know what your concerns are. My name's Kelly Moore, and I live at 1025 South Logan. And I was wondering why you did not address the letter to the state regarding H. Bill. Well, I think it's 76, regarding sanctuary cities. It was one of the questions I asked two weeks ago. Gary, you got an answer for uh, Mr. Moore? Well, there is a... Uh, a uh, Welcoming community resolution the council will be dealing with tonight uh, as far as the council not responding Kelly to your request that um, The mayor and council declare Moscow a sa uh, Sanctuary city uh, that's not something that's before the council so certainly you can ask but the council is elected not to take action on that at this time Okay Okay, thank you Okay, we will move on to item number five, with this, which is a Citizens Commission report on the Moscow Arts Commission. Kathleen, you have the podium. <clears throat> it's 
So I'm going to introduce Iris Mays, who's our chair of the Moscow Arts Commission, and she'll go through this PowerPoint. Hi, Iris. Hi, everyone. Thanks for the opportunity to share what we've been doing for the last year. Um, and so I have been here before. Last year, Robin Olgren was chair, but she asked me to do the report, so I feel a little more less nervous than, than last year. <laughs> um, so we have some different committees on the um, on the art commission, and I guess I should go back one slide just so you can see all the different people. We do have two vacant slots, so if you know anyone who you think would be a great fit for the art commission, we would like to recruit for that. Um, and one of those positions could be a University of Idaho student, so we're we're working on that. Um, so these are our committees. Our Art Walk Committee also includes some of the different miscellaneous events. So this year we have the Mayor's Arts Award, which I'll talk about a little bit. Community Outreach. Um, so that is kind of working with like the Transit Center to do art projects on campus um, and some other things. They've originated first Thursday, so I'll go through that. Our Public Art um, Committee. Um, looks at the different opportunities for public art and we spent the last you know couple years which you're aware of the public art plan and so now we're well positioned to do a bigger work and our our one percent funds have been accumulating for that um, and then third street gallery it always has great shows so i'll cover some of those highlights as well um, so art walk last year um, here's some of the statistics it's just gotten bigger every year with more collaborations <coughs> more artists involved and um, and just different fun highlights. We opened up the streets a little further. I mean, we closed the streets a little further, so had a little more space, and just all kinds of fun things happening. And then this year, it's going to be um, June 16th, 2017. So um, another thing that we did with community outreach, uh, we developed a poet laureate position. So this is a stipend, kind of honorarium position. And our first poet laureate is um, a writer, a poet, Tiffany Midge, and she got her MFA at U of I. She's a Native American writer, and um, it's just been a wonderful um, addition and to have her at some of the different events and writing poems and, and reading for us and different things. Uh, we've used our small projects budget to do um, some different vinyl wraps, and so that's been going on for a couple years. Um, in the past, we've also done bike racks, but this last year we focused on getting more of those um, utility boxes covered with beautiful art. And that's a jury process, so we'll make up a jury from the Art Commission um, and sometimes some other folks, and then uh, a select artwork that, that artists submit. Another collaboration that's been ongoing that Kathleen set up that's wonderful with the university is the Transit Center, the new Transit Center at University of Idaho. And these are artworks from the University of Idaho Sculpture students. And so those get switched out every year or so. And then a new addition for this next year will be inside. Um, we have an, a member of the Art Commission who has arranged for some of the the fashion design collection, they have 10,000 pieces stored on campus, and those will be shown at the Transit Center over the next year. And looking at the jazz era to kind of go along with the 50-year anniversary of the jazz festival. Um, the waterways exhibit was huge that we got to have a Smithsonian. This is the first Smithsonian. Um, they do tour exhibits, and it's the first one that's come to Moscow, so that's really exciting. And um, Kathleen was instrumental in making that happen. Um, and uh, there were a lot of students who came through, lots of the public, and um, it was a neat collaboration also with the Historic Society, Latah County Historic Society. So 500 people signed into the guest book, um, 
and many, many students got to come and experience the different interactive aspects. Um, the city has a history of doing entertainment in the park. This has been a wonderful series. It's very well attended and appreciated by the community with um, an early segment for children and then um, going into the music right after from 7 to 8. The Mayor's Arts Award. So this was a really fun year, as it is every year. And um, we helped the mayor give awards to all of these different folks. And um, just really hearing some incredible stories, um, incredible poetry. And Tiffany Midge opened with some of her poetry. And so just a really wonderful night of acknowledging our local arts artists and art contributors. So we're working on implementing pieces of the public art plan. Um, the library has been collaborating with the city to do some installation there, so that's exciting. We've been working on that for several years, trying to figure out when, where, and how to engage with them. Um, the Transit Center Sculpture Garden will get rotated again. Uh, the city did this Wisecape garden um, that has been implemented to demonstrate how people can use less water on their gardens. So that's that's a good one. Um, yep, and then we looked at the vinyl wraps. Yeah, we'll try to do some bike racks, bus station, maybe work with the new downtown bathroom if possible. That's yet to be seen. Um, and then some upcoming great artwork in the Third Street Gallery. And we're going to have in the fall, we're excited about the U of I football exhibit. So we'll have some different um, artifacts and art around the U of I football. So that's going to be really fun. And, yep. Um, just some of the themes that we work on, um, you know, we try to collaborate with the different city departments and, um, you know, because we can't do this alone. And um, we're interested in looking at some of the return on investment of public art. So, you know, we're kind of inspired by what was happening with the farmer's market and so hoping to look at how our public art and um, the, all the art commission work sort of contributes to that quality of life and, and the economics of our city. Um, Yep, and just to, to close with our gratitude, we're grateful. We're, we were grateful to have Gina on our commission this last year and look forward to working with Jim. Um, and we're just grateful that we have this program and we want to show that value to you. So, any questions? Well, thank you, Iris. Um, a couple of the things, the art walk is just wonderful, always in June, that's a wonderful thing. And uh, this, this year, this past year, I was able to go to it because we didn't have AIC that same week, which is great. And I think the way it falls this year is the same. So. Yeah, we changed, we shifted the date one week, so it seems to be working out a little bit better. That is terrific. And then the arts awards that we do in the fall, is that was a wonderful evening. It was it's really, really, good really cool. Too. So we do that every two years. So. It takes a lot to put that on, but it's so fun. <laughs> oh, it is. It's fun about it. Questions for Gina? I do. Thank you, sir. <clears throat> Iris, I love the boxes that you've wrapped with the art. You want me to go back to that? Or? You, don't, you don't necessarily have to. I love the one right there by Zip Trip, Laura McDonald's. Yes. That's such a fun. What's the average lifespan of those? Do you know? I mean, well, is it? Yeah, it's supposed to be like three to five years. We haven't had to replace any of them yet, um, but it just depends on how they weather and how, how they fade. And so we will be looking at replacing them. One of our projects for this next year, we're, um, we got a grant to ask um, the, you want to talk about that, Josh, from the city of Boise to come help us with our maintenance. Yeah. So the one box that's been uh, changed out is the one at Helioterra. Oh, yeah. And um, yeah. that's because of the um, sun and it just broke down the color. But um, we're hoping to have Josh Olson from the city of Boise come up and help us with looking at our existing um, public art asset, you know, what we have in our community, and then doing a, um, helping us draft a long-term maintenance plan on our collection. And so he's a curator for the city of Boise, and that's all he does is take care of their public art. So we're hoping to get them up here this spring to get us started on that part of the project of the master plan. Mm -hmm. All those wraps are sure nice. They're sure decorative. They're fun. So though. fun. Yeah. yeah. I have a question. Mine yep. has to do, there was the 30, 30, 30. Yep. And is that going to continue? Or, or how did you get that? And then I had another question to follow up with that. Well, we had a previous Arts Commission member 
uh, Dana Aldis that moved over from Seattle and brought the Hi. idea with her. And so she helped us put that together. And, um, yeah, we'll look at that. Well, the reason I'm asking is I, I did a 30-30-30 when I saw the exhibit come with my students and then brought them to the exhibit. And I was just wondering if maybe you could do something district-wide oh, because you do so much art here and then that, and we could get that throughout the, you know, a connection between the school district and yep. whatever you're doing, some sort like of. Like a kid's version or something? Yeah. Yeah, that could be really fun. Uh, we talked about that doing like a 555 for the mm -hmm. kids or something like that. Yeah. Um, but yeah, that would be a possibility. Yeah, it was really fun. I worked with the art teacher at the school and then the kids came and got to see. Yeah. Mm. Well, in this last year, the Smithsonian time timing was the same as the 3030. So we opted oh, for the okay. Smithsonian instead of 303030. Okay. And we just also felt like that it could lose its um, energy if we did it every single year. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, um, but we will huh? take that under mm -hmm. consideration I for wonder. sure. Yeah, the other thing that um, Kathleen has been successful getting some of our small grants. Um, so Idaho Commission on the Arts to help fund some of our different other things too. So I should mention that. Yeah, well, I appreciate it. Thank you. Okay. Other questions? Thank you very much, Thank Irish, you. Uh, and Kathleen, for the nice report. <clears throat> okay, we will move on to item number six, which is a public hearing on 8th Street Right Away Vacation. Les McDonald, unless you have the podium. Good evening, Mayor, members of the Council. This evening we have before us a request for a vacation of a portion of public right-of-way. This is something we haven't done in a while, and I know there's some new Council members uh, since the last of these. Uh, there is a process involved here. It is a, um, a public hearing process where we will take testimony uh, regarding um, folks' perspective on the uh, proposed vacation, and then ultimately the council will make some decisions about how it may want to proceed or not uh, regarding the vacation. We'll start by setting the stage uh, as to what the request is about uh, and then some of the parameters that uh, are worth considering in the process. So to start with, the area we're talking about is uh, kind of the south central part of the city. Its uh, location is 8th and Harrison. So this uh, circle represents the parcel 503 um, West, or excuse me, East 8th Street, uh, which <coughs> is the parcel of land that adjoins um, 8th Street um, and the portion of 8th Street that's being requested for vacation. So it would be the north boundary line of that parcel right there. Harrison runs north-south, 8th Street obviously east-west through here, um, the other portions of the street network uh, surrounding that. To zoom in a little bit on some of this, uh, one of the, the items that came up was uh, in discussions actually just this morning with administration was what is the history we're seeing for vacations uh, in the area. So this is actually a, a copy of a portion of our uh, plat map that shows dedications in green and vacations in red. So the dedications uh, that you see mainly here along the south side of 8th Street and then up in this area, uh, this is an alley uh, up in this, this zone, uh, those are dedications uh, from private property owners to the city for the purpose of public right of way. And um, the red ones uh, that are shown are vacations. So uh, if we've had existing right-of-way that was dedicated at some point, whether through an individual dedication or with a subdivision of some type or a plat, um, that was no longer deemed to be needed by the city. Uh, they went through a vacation process at some point and approved a vacation. So all those you see in red uh, are vacations of public right-of-way that happened at different times. Uh, this original green right-of-way through here uh, was dedicated back in, I believe it was 1891. So this goes back a ways. Um, these vacations occurred, uh, this one I think was in the 50s. These were here uh, at about 2005 and 2010, if I remember the dates correctly through there. Can't quite make them out on the screen. Um, 
the ones along Harrison are of interest in that the property we're looking at, of course, is right here. And so they are in uh, you know, close proximity uh, to this particular vacation request. Uh, you'll see a string of them right along the west side. Those are 10 feet wide. Uh, they've been requested for different reasons. Uh, one in particular here, there was a garage that got constructed out into the right of way. Uh, and so a vacation request became the you know, solution of choice, if you will, to eventually resolve that encroachment issue. Uh, the others had to do with some redevelopment of some properties uh, and other reasons where folks were just looking to expand their footprint of their parcels. Uh, and in those cases, the city had uh, recognized that we had 80 feet of width of right-of-way, which is similar to what we're facing here on 8th Street in this item, uh, and chose to vacate the westerly 10 feet along those block frontages. So it just gives you an idea of what's going on in the area or what has happened historically. Uh, the green, again, uh, dedication to the city for street purposes, and the red ones were vacations of public right-of-way back to private property ownership. With the proposed vacation we'd be looking at here this evening, if it was to go forward, then essentially this map would change to reflect uh, where the southerly 10 feet of that green bit uh, would become vacated and the northerly 10 feet would, would remain. We'll zoom in on this a bit so it'll be a little easier to see as we work our way through. Uh, this gives you a shot from our aerial. Uh, again, 8th Street here, Harrison here, the alley on the east side. This is that parcel that I referenced earlier, 503 East 8th Street. And the area that we're talking about for the vacation uh, is here. Um, there was the original 20 feet of right-of-way that was shown in green in that last map that was dedicated to the city back in 1891. And then the vacation request that's before us this evening is this yellow hatched area. So it's the south 10 feet of that 20 feet, 20-foot uh, parcel. The current right-of-way of 8th Street, shown here in blue, is a uh, width of uh, 80 feet, so from the south end there to the north side there. And if we were to bring in those colors uh, that I used on the previous uh, overheads, you'll see again the green is the area that was dedicated back in 1891, the red of the previous vacations, and if this vacation goes forward, then our map would look like this, where the south 10 feet would be vacated and the north 10 feet would not. Um, that would create uh, some inconsistency on that south property line or south right-of-way line where we'd come along here, jog up 10, jog back, and then continue on. So it would be the first piece of right-of-way vacated along this several block section of 8th Street, as you may have noted in the, the bigger picture. Okay. A little bit of other background that's related. This is a portion of our 2016 bicycle route and facilities map that was approved by the council last spring. Uh, this shows uh, bike routes uh, throughout the city. In this particular case, these green uh, lines represent a, an easy level bike route. The green dots indicate that it's part of our greenway. And then the connected red circles um, indicate that there are share rows that will be going down on this section of roadway. <laughs> Our parcel that we're looking at with the vacation is represented by the blue dot right here. So the vacation is on a bike route. It is on the greenway in an area where we have a share row system that will be put on the street. Um, that comes into play a little bit with respect to potential future use of the roadway. Uh, you know, could it change from this plan to some other plan at some point? Uh, you know, part of what we're looking at is you know, what is the use of the current use of the right of way? How could it be used in the future? Should be part of your consideration about what we do with this this property. So just a bit of additional information. Uh, this will give you some uh, views from the street view off of Google Earth to give you an idea of what it looks like out there. Uh, we are actually standing on 8th Street at this point looking to the east, and the parcel that's involved here, uh, 503 East 8th Street, is here. And this is Harrison Street crossing, going from north to south. Zoom in a little bit. Again, the parcel here on the right. The area of vacation that's proposed is roughly represented by this red box. So it's a 10-foot wide um, section of right-of-way. Again, the south 10 feet of the overall 80-foot wide right-of-way. Uh, just to give you a little bit of a reference. 
And then we'll kind of swing around to the right. Uh, this is now Harrison Street. Uh, 8th Street is paved. Harrison Street is generally gravel, but it has some grindings on it, asphalt grindings that we put on over the years uh, to try to keep the dust down and improve that road condition a little bit. Uh, in general, that road is not fully developed. You can see a little bit of curb line coming around. There's some sidewalk here. Uh, I don't think there's any on the west side here. And then grindings on up to the top of the hill. This is on the other end of the property. So now again, we're back on 8th Street. We're looking west. And this is the alley that would be on the east end of um, our vacation area. Um, this would be the, the frontage uh, in the vacation piece that we were just referencing. And kind of looking up the alley, just to give you an idea what's there. Part of the um, interesting thing about this streetscape is that there's a bit of a hill here. Uh, it's a little hard to see in the uh, in the photos because of the amount of vegetation that's involved, but most of this slope and all this vegetation is on the existing right-of-way. You can see there's a bit of a grade climb up the alley here. Uh, it's a little steeper here, I think, and then it drops off down into the alley itself, just to give you a bit of uh, reference. Okay, now, as to process. <laughs> When we receive a request for a vacation of public right-of-way, there's a couple of steps that we go through. Uh, one of the first things we do uh, in public works is we send out inquiries to the um, utility portions of the city, so water and sewer uh, portions of public works, to ask them about um, you know, the existence of city facilities within the area that's being considered for vacation. We also send out that inquiry to the franchise utility, so power, gas, cable, you know, folks of, of that nature, uh, to find out if they have, and again, have any facilities there or any um, concerns about a potential vacation of a portion of that right-of-way. In this case, uh, we did receive a response from a VISTA, and that uh, email's in your packet, that says that, yes, indeed, they do have a gas line located within this 10-foot right-of-way area that's being considered for vacation. Uh, so that'll come into play. Uh, if the council chooses to move forward with the vacation, uh, there's a, a section of the uh, ordinance that addresses uh, retention of, of rights for franchise utilities that, it, that are out there today. So that's the one that's been identified as uh, existing uh, there today from the franchise utilities. Uh, not aware of any city utilities within this 10-foot section. The next step uh, is we go through a public notice process. So we actually send out certified mail um, letters to, in this case, to all the residents within a 300-foot radius of the site. We also went another 300 feet uh, with non-registered mail, uh, so a total of 600-foot radius all the way around the location, uh, letting folks know about the proposed vacation and this public hearing and their opportunity to come here this evening <coughs> and provide any testimony they may choose to regarding the request. Uh, it is also put into the um, paper of record, so in this case the daily news, uh, on consecutive uh, periods of time, a certain amount of time has to be in the paper, so that has also occurred. Then that brings us all to where we are this evening, which is the public hearing. So the public hearing really is intended to uh, allow the council and the mayor to take in testimony uh, from the public, from the applicant, uh, about the proposal, uh, and uh, then that will help inform the council's decision on how they would like to move forward. There are some things in the process to consider. Um, after the public hearing is closed, then you will take up the, the issue of the ordinance. Do you want to address the ordinance which is set up to vacate that right away per the request? but some things to consider as part of that process. Um, the test in the state of Idaho for vacation of public right-of-way is that it has to be expedient for the public good. This is important because you have to consider whether or not giving up public lands is to the public good. Right? It can't necessarily be just because um, you know maybe we don't need it or that somebody is asking for it, that type of thing. There has to be a public good component considered to give up public property, because that's what this is about, giving up public property, right, right of way. So that has to be kind of first and foremost, and you're thinking about should this occur or not. Anytime we go through a vacation, that's part of the consideration. We cannot set conditions 
upon the vacation. And what that means is we can't ask for payment for the land. We can't say, hey, if we give you this, then we want you to make these kind of improvements or things of that nature. It has to be essentially free and clear that we're going to vacate it and vacate it to the adjacent property. Okay. The state statutes talk about vacations of property are split equally to either side. So it's written around if you vacated an entire roadway, you'd split it right down the middle and give it to either side or as the council deems appropriate. In these kind of situations where we've only got on one side of the right of way and we're retaining all the rest of the right of way, then generally it's it's you know the practice that it would vacate to that side, the, the adjacent parcel, because it will then be connected to that parcel. In this particular case, um, the original dedication came from the property to the south, so it makes sense to then connect it to that property to the south. Okay. There is the ability to retain uh, franchise and city utility rights. So I was talking a little bit earlier about a VISTA and their gas line. So there's a section, I believe it's section two within the ordinance, uh, the draft ordinance in the packet that retains those rights. So if there's a franchise utility that has a right to be in the right of way based on a franchise agreement <laughs> or what type of utility they are, such as telecommunication, then they would retain that right to be there and maintain their facilities <laughs> in the street or what was street right away that would then be vacated. Okay. All right. <laughs> Recommendations. Okay. The um, the other thing we do in this process is staff certainly takes a look at the uh, proposal as does the Transportation Commission. Transportation Commission provides us uh, input on long-range planning and things that may affect the overall transportation network. And so we route um, vacations just like we route subdivisions uh, through Transportation Commission. In this case, uh, the Transportation Commission, uh, after considering the request and, again, discussion about, you know, what could we be doing with this long term? Are there needs uh, that perhaps uh, need, you know, could be met by retaining this right away? They uh, recommended that the uh, vacation be approved, that the request be approved. Now, on the staff side, uh, <coughs> from the Public Works Department perspective, part of what we look at, again, is what potentially are the long-term needs. There's a bike route here. Uh, there's not a bus route. Could there be someday, perhaps? Our current street standards, it fits well within that. Could we someday <coughs> see a widening? Could we see a need to expand sidewalks? You know, would there's a desire perhaps to do something with street trees and tree lawns, those types of things. We don't really know. And it's it's the whole crystal ball thing. You're looking ahead, trying to figure out, okay, is there something long term that perhaps we would put this property um, you know, into use uh, to, to resolve? In this case, the staff has not <coughs> identified anything specific. And that's not uncommon because, again, you're looking long term. Uh, part of what we do is look at, you know, as a city, we're going to be here. We've been here over 100 years. We're going to be here a lot longer than that looking into the future. We don't really know what the future will bring. So in, is generally our practice, and, and we're sticking with it here, that we would recommend denial of the vacation. And the reason for that, again, is that we don't know for sure how we may use the property. Uh, this would be the only piece at this time, anyway, that uh, would be vacated along the east-west 8th Street corridor. Um, and so we didn't feel that it's really in the public interest to vacate the right of way at this time per this request. Okay. One other item I should mention, and uh, I'm sure it's something that the applicants uh, will address this evening it, because in their letter they, they talked about some of this, so you've seen it, is uh, I believe that there may be some discussion about improvements that may be made uh, if and when they choose to develop property or redevelop the property at some date. Again, thinking back about the no conditions component, um, the council cannot say, yes, we'll vacate it if you go do a street, imp street improvement. That really can't be part of the, of the consideration. Um, if property is developed, it has to meet the development standards at that time, which in some cases does require uh, frontage improvements depending on what type of development it, it could be. So just something to, to keep in mind as we work our way through this. And that's it in my presentation. So at this point, any questions you might have? Otherwise, I'll get out of the way and Questions for last year, Council Art? Yeah, I got a couple of them in sort of the <clears throat> techno area of things. Yes, sir. Um, the city 
essentially has charge of street trees within the city right of ways, right? Correct. If we vacate that piece of the right of way and looking at the aerial view that you showed, mm -hmm. there are some substantial trees along that alignment. By moving the vacating that right of way, do we uh, abrogate our responsibility for those trees? Well, that would be something that's better answered by the Parks Department and potentially legal, but uh, certainly the transfer of, of ownership from right-of-way to private property then removes the, uh, the city from the ownership of those trees. So we would not have a say from that perspective of what happens to those trees at any point in the future. What would come into play is uh, under our, street, under our uh, tree ordinances within the city as a general rule, uh, if there's anything in there that would affect it, and I would I defer to legal if they have any further thoughts on it. I, I'm not sure I can answer your question completely. The only thing that I would add to that is if we do the vacation, then it will become the property owner to decide what to do with it. The city will no longer have any control over requiring street trees on the parcel. Or, street tree, on right away. or a street tree removal in that case either. Yes, well, it didn't look like it was actually any trees. It looks like it was a hill. It's most of a slope yeah. of a hill is what they're talking about being vacated. Yeah, looking at the overhead view, though, it looked like there's a lot of trees right down on that bank growing right now. Yeah. yeah there are some, some in here. Yeah. The, uh, the placement of this would be, if I recall, approximately nine feet from the sidewalk <coughs> back to where that right-of-way vacation would begin, the southerly 10 feet. So it's not at the back of the sidewalk, it'd be a little bit further back. Some of this vegetation would be in that, that zone between the vacated portion and the back of the sidewalk, uh, but I think a fair amount of it would be within that 10 foot, and then some of it's on private property as well, mm -hmm. going up the slope. Well, that's sooner we don't really know right this minute. Um, just to move on, um, with the Avista line going through there, um, if the building envelope is the point of contention here for accessing that piece of right-of-way and getting rid of the right-of-way so the building envelope can expand, uh, if the Avista line is there, does that mean that the building envelope has to be pushed back and essentially it's a wash? That might be a question. For for maybe Bill? Or did you hear that, Bill? What Art was I apologize, Gary was asking me a question. Or yeah. you want to repeat it, Bill? I so would be happy. <laughs> has to do with so the it has to do with the gas line. So if the gas line is running along through the, the right-of-way, and maybe the, I don't know, but perhaps the reason for the right-of-way vacation is to enhance the building envelope for whatever might decide to go there by way of setbacks, uh, doesn't that kind of make it a wash if you can't build that close to a gas line? It really kind of depend upon where the gas line is actually located, and the owner may have the opportunity to relocate that gas line to accommodate some construction. Okay, so we don't really know there. And my last one. Okay. Uh, Let me just add one thing. The gas lines, will, uh, the investor will still have the right to have their gas line where it is now. They will not have to move it. Okay, now that, that was so... That was just a confusing statement. So a Vista doesn't have to move the gas line no, if this is vacated. No, if, if it's vacated, the, the city's right to the property to control what's in there will be affected, but the existing um, franchisee's rights uh, for that easement will be unaffected. Oh. So whatever right they have with that line right now for maintenance purposes, they will retain. So in the packet it said five feet. So if that gas line is on... <clears throat> through the right of way, you move the five feet back, essentially the building envelope is going to remain the same as if there was no vacation of the right of way. Bill had a point. There are some implications regarding setbacks from property lines that may affect the property boundary. So traditionally, you're not going to be able to build up to that property line. In this zoning district, you're going to have a minimum of a 13 foot street side setback or a 15 foot front setback. And so oftentimes that may occupy that space where that gas line is. And if the property line remains farther back, then that building would have to be set back farther from that location. So while they're, you know, the vacation means they are not likely to be able to place a building in that 10 feet, they would not likely be able to place a building there anyhow because of setbacks. Yep. And lastly, um, if a duplex, uh, fourplex, four unit apartment or something were constructed there, 
would the developer be obliged to do any street frontage improvements per se, just by nature of the development? Go ahead, Bill. Yes, under the city code requirement, they will be required to bring street frontages up to current street standards, whether that involves paving on Harrison or sidewalk installation or potential improvements to the alley or all potential improvements that they would be required to make. So in other words, the note that's associated with this packet is really just volunteering to do what would be required anyway should development occur. I have not I have not read the letter of request, but if they make reference to those for improvements, yes, that would be required at the time of development. Okay. Other quick Catherine. Mine had to do with the historical piece, because you said this had been the way it has been since eighteen ninety. And so originally when they put the eighty feet out there, they were not they were seeing into the future because they didn't know what was gonna go there. Do we have any other things that we know that would we would put into that ten foot space? Besides, like what you were talking about, if we had a bus route and, like, when you thought about what could possibly be, yeah, certainly the uh, the the practice back in the late 1800s, early 1900s was to do 80 foot rights of way within mm -hmm. the city of Moscow. So, all through the Fort Russell district and in this part of town, you'll see an 80 foot uh, with most streets, uh, pretty common. The uh, potential for building things or expanding things into the area is, again, that's something we looked at quite a bit. Uh, you know, we don't know for sure what it could be. You know, if a bu bus route someday were to come here, you know, it's not a direct shot through east-west, so it, you know, it jogs around a bit on 8th Street. Could it be a bus route? Well, perhaps. Um, could you then end up with a bus stop that you might need the extra space here? Perhaps. Uh, but, you know, it's probably not terribly likely, I would say, at this stage. But the flip side is you also see, for instance, here on the outer edges of an 80-foot right-of-way, you have a franchise utility. And so those types of things also happen within that 80-foot corridor. So it may not always be just a city project. It could be something with one of the franchise utilities uh, where they have need of those areas as well. Again, we don't have anything definitive at this point that says, yeah, we have a plan in 20 years we're going to build you know, X, Y, or Z. Uh, it's really more of uh, looking at maintaining the options uh, for the public for um, the corridor as compared to is there truly a public benefit to releasing the right-of-way. Did you have another question? And then it's just the follow-up of that. And so uh, potentially, especially with this being the first kind of request in this neighborhood, um, is there – a likelihood that other people then would follow suit and also I mean when because you know when you showed the swath all of a sudden <laughs> there's looks like people go well we should it right well I think what's happened on Harrison is uh, maybe a good indicator that it certainly could uh, we mm -hmm. could see requests from other properties along the 8th Street corridor saying, well, mm -hmm. let's do the same thing on my place for whatever reason they may uh, may have. Now, obviously, we've seen it uh, through here for different reasons. This one, again, uh, was related to a, a garage construction and encroachment. Mm -hmm. uh, and these, I think, were probably more related to some potential development or redevelopment of parcels. Um, so people have different reasons. But, yeah, you know, this is the first in this area. Mm -hmm. doesn't mean it would be the last. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Other questions for Les? Uh, Gary, you had a point you want to make? I just wanted to mention that I think it's relevant to look at the entire corridor and determine whether or not there is a, um, there might be additional requests for vacation. It's important to remember that 80 foot right of ways in this area, as in Fort Russell, uh, take up a lot of people's side yards and front yards. And uh, certainly the city has the right to use that public right of way. However, there'd probably be civil rebellion if you went into Fort Russell and started putting a backhoe in someone's front yard. Um, the mention, and, and with all deference to public works, I don't think you'll ever hear a public works department ever say give up public right of way. It just right. doesn't make sense. Uh, on the other hand, the example of the uh, garage illegally uh, encroaching into the public right-of-way, the council heard those comments and elected to grant a uh, vacation so that garage could come within our code or could become legal. So it's an individual request. Council looks at it as an individual request. I'm not saying you shouldn't consider the corridor as a whole, 
but it is an individual request of a private property. Well, <clears throat> all relevant factors should be considered by the council. Other questions for last? Um, we'll go with Walter and I'll come back to you, Jim. Um, back to the gas line. Yes. There's verbiage in the proposed vacation ordinance that says vacation of property described shall not include existing franchise <coughs> rights and utilities or existing public utilities as of the effective date of this ordinance. You said the only thing that's been identified in there existing at the moment is a gas line. Correct. And should this be done, a VISTA has the right to go in there, work on it, maintain it, replace it in like kind if they find the one they've got in there is deteriorated to the point it's got to be replaced. So they would have the right to do that. They would have the right to do that. They would have the right to do any other actions that they would do under their franchise agreement uh, rights within the public right-of-way. So right now, uh, they can go build facilities, new facilities, within the right-of-way as a franchise utility. Uh, I believe, and again, legal would probably want to weigh in here, but I believe that those rights would be retained. Essentially what we're doing here is would we, we would not diminish the rights that the franchise utilities have today with this transfer of ownership. So whatever they can do today, they could continue to do in the future. That leads to my question. Does that apply to a franchise cable company or a underground power line or an overhead power line that's not there now? This, the, the way it's worded in the proposed ordinance is existing franchise rights it doesn't. It, it also includes existing utilities, mm -hmm. but right now in that right of way, I would think that the cable TV people, a Vista Power, name me somebody else, has the right because it's a city right of way and they have a, have a franchise, the ability to go in there and, and construct something that's not there now. So the way this is written, and I, I don't have a problem. I'm just trying to understand it. Those rights for future work by non-presently existing actual utility products is retained. I wouldn't Pardon. believe for any future products that... that I, I'm sorry, I couldn't hear the I question. would say no, but something that's not existing now, I don't think they'd be able to enlarge it. There is a public right-of-way that they would be able to put in their um, a cable line if they wanted to bury a cable through there. They'd have to do it in the public right-of-way. They wouldn't be able to encroach and add on to whatever purpose of that easement that is existing at the time right now. I don't think they'd be able to enlarge the use of that. They would be able to maintain the use of it. If I may, Mr. Mayor, to, to follow. So the verbiage in, quote, include existing franchise rights might not be correct in this, based upon your answer, Rob? No, I would say that existing franchise rights right now, if they wanted to go and do that before you vacated it, yeah, they could go out and do that. So the existing rights um, shall not include the existing rights of the franchise. I'm not sure that they will, those rights, that they haven't exercised them, they haven't put them to any use. So you've been talking about just potential, that they potentially could come in and do something. I think that might be a little speculative. I don't know. I could definitively say that they would have the right to go in and put in something brand new. <coughs> Unless they were replacing or maintaining something. Expanding on Rod's, uh, I believe he's correct that if it is in the ground now, that at the time it's vacated, they can continue that use. They could use all of the their bundle of rights that they have for that buried franchise utility. <clears throat> if there is existing public right of way next to it that someone who wanted to put in, say, a fiber optic cable, they would likely have to put it within the existing public right-of-way and not enter on this private property, what amounts to private property, subject to uh, Idaho Code 50-311, which lays out what rights are retained. So I don't believe you'd be able to put a okay. new franchise utility in a vacated piece of property. Okay. Jim. Um, I noticed that the applicant uh, has said that they will uh, re rebuild the sidewalk on 8th Street as a, a consideration uh, as part of their application. Is that a contractual obligation that they would have to do that? 
if if we would approve this vacation, they would then be obligated to do that in such in such such a time frame. Well, as as I mentioned earlier, as we can set no conditions upon the vacation, so we cannot create any kind of contractual relationship there that says that if the council chooses to vacate, they will then do something or build something or pay something. So, whether or not they chose in the future to build uh, frontage improvements, you know, on the parcel is purely up to them and really is not part of uh, the consideration of a vacation itself. And the fact that they're stating that they would do so is not a contractual obligation on their part. I would say that it's not binding. No. That they would not have to do that. We can't condition that. I mean, that's just saying that they, that they may do this. Other questions before I open the public hearing? Thank you, Les. I will now open up the public hearing. I will ask the applicant to come up and explain to us what exactly it is he's trying to do or she is trying to do. Please state your name, sir, and your address. Good evening, Mayor and Council staff. My name is Sean Heffley. I'm here on behalf of the property owner, Nathaniel Ely, um, requesting this vacation of right away. Um, <clears throat> Maybe a, a quick background. I am uh, from Sandpoint. I moved here in 2013 to uh, attend the University of Idaho School of Law. I'm in my last semester. Um, prior to this, I spent 15 years in construction and development in Sandpoint. I uh, worked closely with the, uh, the city staff, the engineers, the planners on a number of subdivisions and issues just like this. Um, so I look forward to uh, doing that here. I call Moscow my home now, and, um, and I think that uh, this is a great community, and I'd like to see it uh, continue in the direction that it seems to be headed. Uh, with that said, I'd like to add some clarifications maybe on some of the comments that were made. Um, <clears throat> first of all, uh, going to uh, Councilman Boland's uh, question regarding our statements within the letter that we submitted to you. But, what we are saying is that by favorable consideration of this request for vacation of right of way, it will open up design options that are presently not available to us. Those design options will trigger the requirements set forth already in your city code that will force our uh, force the project to upgrade the the streets and the sidewalks. W without the vacation, our design options are constricted uh, to a point where the economic viability of the higher density housing um, is less attractive. And uh, there's a number of, of things we could discuss regarding why that's the case, but that, that is the case for the options that we're pursuing. So we're, we're not saying that we would, if you give us this, we'll do that. We're saying that the vacation of the right-of-way allows for design opportunities that are not presently available. Those design opportunities trigger the requirements. And so by favorable consideration, those requirements would be done and the streets would be improved. I, I hope that clarifies things a little bit. Um, <clears throat> I also wanted to uh, comment uh, to uh, Councilman Steed, um, appreciating your question uh, regarding the uh, potential for future utility providers to be limited to that 10 feet that would be um, <clears throat> given over to Mr. Ely. Uh, we would still have, as a city, 70 feet of right-of-way. The current city standards for any new streets is 60 feet. And we have uh, determined within our design standards that 60 feet is sufficient for utility providers to engage in the services that they need. We have um, more than enough room, uh, even with the vacation, to allow for future use to go through underground. And so I think that should be uh, just noted. Um, and another thing that maybe wasn't emphasized uh, quite uh, as much as it should be, if you were able to go out to the site and look, uh, the, the slope that we're talking about is actually quite steep. I mean, it's, it's over a two to one. And um, the, any potential use that the city may uh, look out towards the future would be really difficult to develop in that area because it would require um, an, a, a sizable engineered retaining wall in order to make use of that space, especially if there's now 
uh, single family homes on the setbacks. So that's something to keep in mind. This isn't just flat ground where you can just go in and, and you know, put your, uh, your utilities in or your benches in or, or those kinds of things. It's very steep terrain. Um, so those are just some clarifications. Um, one, one further clarification too, because I think this was something that, uh, that was mentioned. Um, a VISTA will retain all the rights that it currently has and if there is a issue with proximity in terms of the uh, location of the current gas line relative to the edge of our building envelope, which I, um, I don't want to butcher your name, so I'm just going to say Councilman Art Betke. Betke. Councilman Betke uh, brought up. Um, <clears throat> at our expense, a VISTA would be, uh, in my experience as a developer, and I've done this many times, um, at our expense, if we needed to move that line a few feet within that 10 feet location, as long as we were the ones paying the bill, then Investa usually is, is amenable to those kinds of things. Okay. So I, I think that was the questions that I saw as uh, I was listening to the comments. Um, I also wanted to say that through this process, uh, I, had, I had the opportunity in Sandpoint to work with a an exceptional engineer and, uh, and citizen, Cody Van Dyke, and I'm pleased to say that my working relationship so far with Les, despite his uh, standard uh, blueprint of denial of this request, has been uh, nothing but positive. He's a, he's a great engineer and, and has, a, has a good head on his shoulders. So I did not uh, I anticipated fully that he would recommend denial, and so just wanted to, to say that's no big deal, Les. <laughs> Um, say, Walter, you get your chance. Uh, so going to really what I think the crux of your decision comes to, which is the uh, public interest. Moscow's adopted a comprehensive plan, and inside that comprehensive plan, it stated a number of goals that the favorable consideration of this right-of-way vacation will help um, further uh, the furtherance of those goals. One is that uh, in Chapter 2, you mentioned <clears throat> that you want to provide a mix of housing and, uh, to increase the economic and lifestyle mix throughout the community. And again, this vacation allows for a design concepts that would create a, a higher density use, um, which, of course, in another, <clears throat> in another area within your comprehensive plan, you note that by increasing those densities, you lower the land cost per unit. And that's exactly what we, would be, what we would be able to do if we were able to push the edge of that building envelope forward into um, the H Street corridor, still again, uh, 13 feet off of what would be the new property line. So still outside the, the edge of our, of our architectural projections would still be three feet to the south of what would be the, uh, what, what would be the current southerly boundary of the right-of-way. So we would still be outside of that. Um, from, from an aesthetic point of view, we would really not be uh, impacting that 20 feet whatsoever other than cleaning up the shrubs that have kind of been overgrown and, and just creating a more usable space for the potential uh, residents there. Um, I mentioned in your comp plan in uh, Chapter 2.56 that you want to, that you that you agree that creating off-site parking um, and alleyway parking helps push the residents closer to the street, creating a more interactive community. The design concept that we're looking at, uh, again, upon favorable consideration, would allow for underground parking, which would then allow us to push those uh, building envelopes closer to the street, creating a more um, integrated and interactive community, which is, again, a stated goal within your comprehensive plan. Uh, <clears throat> chapter 2.2 recognizes that housing demands have a draw for owner occupancy, or rather non-transient housing. The, um, 
The housing concept that we are looking at, again, upon favorable consideration, would be fee simple ownership housing, non-transient. So owner occupancy, that's what we would be after. And uh, as opposed to, and there's nothing wrong with, uh, with rentals, and I understand the, the rental market here in, in Moscow is a, is a necessity. But, but what we're trying to do and what we think the feel of the neighborhood is requiring and to integrate into the neighborhood is create a development that would encourage owner occupancy, again, consistent with your comprehensive plan. <clears throat> and I think that any time that you have a development in front of you, that increases the likelihood of meeting the objectives of the comp plan that the city council has adopted that you are creating a significant public benefit. And so the public benefit is, is fostering development that is in alignment with your comprehensive plan. And by favorable consideration of this request, that's exactly what you're doing, and, and that is a public benefit. Uh, further, um, we go back to, to Councilman Boland's um, noting on the, uh, the request that the streets would be improved, again, because we would be able to do the design as we have, uh, that we're hopefully going to be able to achieve if we have, uh, you know, the, councilman, uh, the council's uh, um, affirmative vote on this. So if there's any other questions that you have for me. Walter had a question, I think. Did you have just, a just a clarification. Sure. My, my questioning about future utilities had to do with would, the, <clears throat> would they be able to go in that vacated 10-foot <clears throat> space, not that they would be required to. Right. Okay. I think the way you stated it a moment ago inferred that I was saying they would have to go there. That wasn't my intent. Understood. Okay. Thank you. Other questions uh, for the applicant before we move on? I got one. Art? Uh, one more, I don't mean to uh, jump the gun on design and things like that, but the reason for the city uh, wanting to push housing closer to the streets is to promote interaction mm -hmm. through that, and that doesn't mean a big blank wall with three bathroom windows on it facing the street. Sure. So this gets into a, something sketching completely outside of what we need to discuss, but your discussion of density <laughs> is a good one, but it's got to be the right kind of density and not one that detracts from the existing neighborhood with all of its little craftsman-y style houses along that stretch. Understood, and I think uh, to, I mean, the best answer for that without getting outside the scope of this particular request is that um, Mr. Ely and, and his uh, company, Ely Construction, is committed to uh, providing high quality, sustainably built housing that the uh, residents can be proud of and that the community as a whole can be proud of. And so um, I think that, um, you know, the answer to that kind of soft question, because we don't have the ability to discuss it in, in uh, particulars here, is that, um, you know, he's committed to well-planned, civic-minded development and, and that um, whatever, whatever ends up on those parcels will um, – meet that standard. Now, whether or not it's the density that we're hoping to achieve and whether or not it is consistent with the stated goals of the comprehensive plan um, is, is really based upon this request. Um, but either way, what's going to be uh, constructed will be, will be of high quality and sustainably built. And, and again, that's something the community will, uh, will be proud to, to see. Okay. Uh Thank you, Mr. Heffley. And I will, <clears throat> I'll ask for anybody else that would like to come up and uh, in favor, please come up and state your name. If you're in favor, come right up here to the podium, sir, and tell us who you are. I need your name and your address. And I'll keep uh, remind council that we're talking about a vacation of a piece of property here, and we are not talking about what is really going to go in there. So keep that in mind as we move forward. Thank you. Yes, sir. Hello. My name is Samuel Brown. And I live at 826 South Harrison, second house down from the lot that's um, in question. And the neighborhood has always been a mixed neighborhood with rentals and homes, but now it seems to be going to high density. There's one across the street, one across Lewis Street, places that go in with no green space, no trees, nothing but parking lot and building. That's what I fear here. That's what it looks to me like. You need that 10 feet so you can get in those two fourplexes and those 16 parking places. 
You know, that's, that's what goes on in our neighborhood. That's what people do. And Harrison Street, despite the fact the city did a great job of hardening it, it's breaking down again. It was just, you know, it was a wonderful job. It really helped, but that was eight years ago. And with parking on the street, both sides, it becomes a one-lane street, the same as Lewis Street. If any of you ever drive up and down Lewis Street in the winter, you can't meet a car there. I don't know how you meet a bicycle there. And yet it's the bicycle route. The property that is there is very large, two city lots. There's only three used, three parcels on the block, each one two city blocks. And uh, I think there's plenty of room to build multi-unit apartments there as is. I don't see the need for an extra 10 feet so that we can maximize the density in a fragile neighborhood. Streets don't go through in our neighborhood. You can't drive Lewis Street more than about five blocks before you have to turn off and go somewhere else. 8th Street dead ends down at the hospital, doesn't go through anymore. So Lewis has become the arterial. And I just don't think the neighborhood can take that much more traffic. I know that there'll be something built there. There'll be some kind of a multi-unit place, but I just don't feel like it ought to be maximized. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Brown. <clears throat> With that, anybody would like to come up and give us their opinion on this, whether it is in favor or against or just general testimony, uh, please give us your name and let us know what your thoughts are. My name is Chris Norden. I live at 428 East 7th Street, so that's the block that is tangent to the northwest to the block in question. And uh, we walk that section of both Harrison and 8th Street several times a week, uh, all times of the year, and uh, have just made some basic observations about the traffic flow in the neighborhood, both pedestrian, importantly bicycle traffic, and then vehicle traffic. And uh, again, I just would uh, second a lot of the comments just made by the previous gentleman that uh, this is a pretty vaguely articulated pro development proposal in a neighborhood where uh, the balance, I guess you would, you would say, of uh, different kinds of use, different kinds of residents uh, is, is pretty, um, pretty fragile, I guess, uh, would be a way to put it. Uh, walking along 8th Street in particular, one notices a lot of pedestrian traffic, a lot of bicycle traffic, and a lot of car traffic. So the idea of adding what might be, what sounds like the desire to expand or at least uh, have the option to expand pretty close to right out onto the street would indicate a really large development project, something that really has not been uh, very clearly articulated with a lot of ifs and maybes about what the effects of that uh, or rather even the scope of that kind of development uh, would in fact be. I will make this point that the uh, current owner of that property did not bother to clear the sidewalk in the winter and we were walking along 8th Street uh, both day and night uh, in a, under fairly dangerous conditions and being buzzed by cars with you know, that much margin with icy streets uh, and uh, no sidewalk to walk on. The sidewalk was precarious to the point of really worrying about breaking one's neck. So, you know, there again, I think that just by way of an illustration that sometimes a 10-foot uh, block rectangle of, of space can make quite a difference. And if something is built really pretty close to out to the, to the street, uh, it's unclear to me what the implications would be in terms of uh, pedestrian traffic, the flow, uh, the east-west. And if you visualize the uh, intersection of Washington and 8th Street, that's the hospital. So you've got an awful lot of people potentially using 8th Street as a, uh, as a walking corridor and likewise a tremendous amount of traffic to and from the uh, 
uh, University of Idaho and down, downtown as well. So, you know, I, I think at this point I would just urge the council to err on the side of caution, to be conservative, if I may put it that way, uh, preserve public, uh, public property uh, until a much clearer presentation is made, something that would indeed be an integrated part of our long-term development plan for the city rather than just an if and a maybe and a trust us because in, ultimately this is someone's idea of a money-making development project and I don't feel that the public good, uh, public interest has really been uh, nailed down in a way that, that uh, uh, makes me as a co-owner of could that public <coughs> property could you wrap it up, feel please? secure. Thank you. Thank you, sir. My name is Neil Cox. I live at 526 East 8th Street. <clears throat> and without knowing what you're going to build over there, I get traffic already or cars parked on my side of the street, which is across the street from where that's going to be, already from the apartments that are up and down the street on 8th Street. If you put another place in, I guess I'll have to let them park in my driveway then around the corner. <clears throat> also, just as a side, I was shoveling my walk the other day, and a lady came by and said, you know, if you lived in an apartment, if you owned an apartment, you wouldn't have to shovel. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, sir. The landlord. David Pierce, 716 East <clears throat> F Street. Sat here listening to this tonight. First thing I'll say is forget about the shoveling of snow. Nobody shovels snow in this town unless they absolutely want to. We don't enforce the ordinance, so many, many people just leave their sidewalks. That's kind of a, out of the question here, but I don't think that was a fair thing to put in. Um, I don't see what's being proposed as being something that's for the public good. At least what we know at this point, yes, there is a proposal of what would be done with the property, but that can that could be changed. We don't know that that's what's going to go there. Um, I think the bike route uh, and consideration of space for the bike route is an important thing to be considered. Um, if we if we knew and we can't know unfortunately what really uh, can go in that property, maybe we'd think a little differently about it, but we don't so I would tend to think this is not something we ought to do. Thank you Thank you, Dr. Pierce. <clears throat> Any others we wish to come up before I come on up, Miss? I can't talk to you when you're back there in the second row. We got to see who you are, what your name is. I couldn't resist. My name's Diane Brown, and um, I uh, live at 826 South Harrison in the same house as that man, <laughs> and um, lived across the street from the illegal garage. Um, for the past 30, 40 years, have lived in that neighborhood for 40 years, and I am totally against this vacation. We have watched the vacation at the illegal garage across the street. We watched what happened across the street, across the alley from the illegal garage, where another apartment went in. We've seen all of the houses in our neighborhood get torn down and huge apartments get built in that space. There's no greenery and they put the parking in the alley. So the alley is going up and down and up and down with traffic all the time. And across the street, I just have to tell you this is what's going on in our neighborhood. 
They're not replacing houses with beautiful, nice houses. They're replacing them with ugly structures. And you may talk about some beautiful design, but an apartment building is an apartment building. And I don't know what this underground parking is supposed to be, underground on 8th Street or underground in our existing alley. You know, so I'm agreeing with the rest of the people here. We don't know enough about what's going on with this property. We've watched our whole neighborhood disintegrate into ugly apartment buildings. Ugly apartment buildings. Okay. Thank you, Miss. Thank, thank you, you, Mrs. Brown. That's my opinion. That's <laughs> <laughs> why America's great. We all have opinions. Mr. It, well, you're going to get a chance to rebut on this, Mr. Heffley. Just wait. Well, I'm going to wait till I hear all the testimony, then I'll bring you back up here. I'm at 428 East. Please state so your I, name I, and, and address. Uh, Leontino Hormel, at 428 East Seventh Street. Might as well have the spouses come up. <laughs> I, I am appreciating hearing your story about 8th Street on that beautiful corner lot. Is that the one with the beautiful trees? We walk by that all of the time. We, I was wondering what you Miss, thought. Miss, please uh, oh, direct I'm sorry. It's up to us or I'm going to have you sit back down. I'm, Thank you. I, they live in a beautiful place, and actually the house that it is, I know that it needs lots of repair, but that <laughs> – I've looked at that lot for a long time since that house has been for sale, and it's, um, it is a craftsman home. Um, I know in a lot of disrepair, but I feel like it'll be a tremendous loss to see that turn into something different, even if it's about expanding it so it's a multi-household owner, you know, lease-to-own type of thing or something like that. I, I, I worry about some of the things that was brought up just recently, and that inspired me to come up and talk about that element because there I have been worried about um, my neighbors and seeing that it is changing significantly and I believe in mixed housing I believe in fair and affordable housing access we don't have much in this uh, in Moscow but I think too showing some caution to what uh, existing property owners and I also know that the house across the alley that's on Logan is also um, it would be compromised a bit too if there were yet another complex surrounding it because it's a completely different type of property. So I would ask that the council take that into consideration that since we don't really know any particular that um, the public good um, is both that right-of-way, the access for cyclists and pedestrians like so many of us, but also just thinking about, you know, what, where is that balance? Thank you. Thank you. Sir, you can come on up if you'd like to speak. My name is Dennis Mulally. I live at 443 7th. And personally, I hate to break anybody's bubble, but that house is gone. It is gone. There's two free fir trees that are gone. You know, and it would enrich the neighborhood to have some fashionable building built there because the old derelict that was there was rotted and falling down. It was a piece of junk. I'd like to see something with some kind of aesthetic value to come into the neighborhood and up the value of our property, you know, without upping the taxes. But uh, <laughs> just to up the value of the property would be great. And I I put in for one variance or a setback so I could build a shop. Oh, well, that's 25 years ago. The only one I had to fight was Nancy because she lived across the street. But uh, other than that, I got the garage put in. That was no problem. And I only needed like three feet, you know, of a 10-foot variance. But personally, I'd like to see a nicer house put in there, whether it's a, a duplex. And I hate to say fourplex, but it's got the room for it. If the guy's got the right for it. I mean, the only problem is the parking. There is a one-way street or no no parking on the south side of 8th Street, so that kind of shoves all the parking back to wherever they can find a place. And I had people parking beside my house all winter because they were too lazy to shovel 8th Street out and make their own parking place. You know, it would get all iced up, and the cars were coming clear a block away. I'd keep a shovel cleaned out because I keep the drain cleaned out, and they use it. 
you know, I kind of complained about it because they cleaned the snow off their car and uh, it builds ice dams and floods my well, basement a little bit, but I uh, live with it. But I'd like to see something decent in there. Okay, thank you, sir. Mr. Halfley, would you like to come back up here, sir? And I will, and I'm going to give you like three minutes, sir. Uh, first, uh, I want to express that Mr. Ely certainly is sensitive to uh, the concerns of all of his neighbors, as uh, any good developer should be. Um, I would like to clarify that the current zoning is R4, and so uh, the density uh, allowances have already been determined by the City Council of Moscow that a desirable product in that neighborhood is uh, a mixed-use, high-density development. So we're not we're not outside the, the realm or scope of what was anticipated at all. Um, uh, and that's understood by this council up here, uh, okay. Mr. Halfley. Um, second, I, I appreciate greatly the neighbor's concerns about the lack of specificity on the uh, design. I can uh, tell you, first, we didn't bring design into this conversation because this wasn't the forum for a design concept and that and that is exactly correct I had stated earlier that we we're talking about the vacation of a, of a piece of property or a piece of land and as far as what is built there that is not part of the discussion here at all tonight and, so. and I appreciate that mr. mayor uh, I can tell you that we have two alternative designs both uh, contingent upon the vacation um, and I, I will go so far as to just say that some one looks like row homes. The other is is a, a complex, but with but a tasteful complex. But that's as much as I think I can say here um, to uh, um, assuage the concerns. It's it's just really difficult in this forum to do that. Um, I would appreciate it real quickly, uh, Les, if you could go to kind of your three dimensional slide that showed like that floating ten feet strip, because I think there needs to be some clarification for everybody's sake on on really where this lies in terms of usability thank you um, and then finally uh, we'll get to that in just a second I want I wanted to uh, you know make sure that we have on the record that no matter what development mr. Ely puts on that property uh, city ordinance already requires on-site parking and so that's just something to, to keep in mind we're, we're fully aware that the parking has to be on site uh, which is why uh, we're our preferable parking is to put underground. It's uh, better aesthetically, it's better use of space, but again, that gets into design concepts for which this is not the venue. <clears throat> this is a little misleading, and I, and I don't mean that. It's just, it's hard to, hard to it's hard to portray, is all I'm saying. The, the, the 10 feet that we are talking about, if, if, if I can walk up there. Oh. <clears throat> Okay, the 10 feet really, oh, I'm not really good at it, is more like right here, almost at the top of the steps. Okay, and the slope here, again, you're, you're looking at probably a 30% grade right there. Um, I mean, right here, coming up to 45% back in here. So we're, we're talking about 10 feet of space that's, that's truly on a, slide, a, 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 a side slope that you would you know, encounter on a on a elk hunt. I mean, it's it's just steep and it's brushy and it's not usable. Nobody walks there. Nobody's uh, again. Even if the city retained it and wanted to utilize that space, the extent of the engineered retaining wall in order to make use of the space, particularly after a structure's been put in place, would be extensive and prohibitive. And, uh, you know, this is a, a low-traffic neighborhood. That's why it is a greenway, and that's why it is a bike route. Uh, the vacation of this right-of-way will have no impact on the, on the bike route. And, in fact, our development anticipates um, uh, bicycles and alternative modes of transportation as being emphasized. And, finally, the, uh, the H Street, uh, essentially the intersection dead ends into what, I think that's Logan? Yep. Yeah. Uh, so the... the idea that there's going to be any kind of greater uh, confluence of traffic other than what is already permitted by ordinance and law for our development is probably 
uh, unrealistic, at least in our lifetimes. I mean, there's it just isn't set up for that. So thank you, Mr. Hefley. Thank you. Okay, with that, I am going to close the public hearing, and we will turn it over to council. There's two issues to keep in mind that I will remind the councilors here. It is number one, if we're going to approve the vacation, and if in, either yes or no, and that will trigger another approval. If it's approved, then we have an ordinance. So there's two functions that we have here tonight. So, but the first is to vacate or not vacate. So I'll turn it over to discussion. Walter? Thank you. A question for staff, probably, probably Bill, maybe less. If development occurs and if it's determined that the sidewalk on 8th is currently existing needs to be replaced, what width <coughs> is it now and what width would it be replaced with? The I believe the current width is 4 feet and the... Um, Current standards for that class of road would be a five-foot sidewalk. Uh, where we sometimes would retain a four-foot is if we're filling a gap or replacing a section that matches four on either end. Um, depending on the situation, we could require a five-foot to match the current standards. Sometimes we would retain the four. But this one runs, if I may, Mr. Mayor, yes, this one runs from a street to an alley. Yeah, it's, it's not, is, doesn't abut the adjacent. Right. And this is one that probably we would look at the five foot to be consistent with the current standard. And if I may, what do you know the curb to curb width of 8th Street right there? We did measure it while I was out there. Uh, I believe it's either 32 or 34 right in that range. Thank you. Okay. If no one else has one, I have a different one, if I may, Mr. Mayor. Okay. Um, again, for staff, maybe legal. In light of uh, Public Works' recommendation to deny um, and the council being faced with a, the 5311 uh, state code that was quoted earlier that empowers us to vacate streets where, quote, deemed expedient for the public good. And yet Public Works is saying they can't find that it is, if I understood less correctly. What position does that put the council in? Do we, can we, are we okay? Well, this body. Should we, just, should we decide to vacate in spite of public works recommendation? Let me be clear. It is your discretion. Um, case law says that it's totally up to your discretion. You would have to articulate whatever. Expedient the public good is on the way to public good. I mean, I decide. So are you suggesting that this council needs to explain what the expedient way for the public good is? Well, you don't have to want to, you'd have to state something that there is some public good and there's probably arguments you can make for both. Like a criteria? Not, not quite the criteria. I think that if you just would have to articulate a public good as to why you're requesting or going to go along with uh, vacation. Okay. Jim. Um, as I see that, it's kind of a catch-22 here on the public good because we, we're, the applicant said, you know, if, if they develop this in the way that they propose to, that they, they will have to improve the, the sidewalk and the, the street frontage, and that will be a public good, but yet we don't know that yet, and so we can't say that that's, that public but good will happen you. for sure. Yeah. So it's kind of a, what do, <laughs> how do you decide that? John, uh, before I go to you, John, I'm grab Gary because he had his hand up on. Yeah. The uh, representations made by the applicant, you can't, as, as Rod indicated, they're unenforceable. They can certainly say they're going to improve the frontage beyond what is necessitated by our current ordinances, but uh, the public good wouldn't be something like improve the sidewalk. Public good would be. Um, similar to the, the uh, findings that you would make in a rezone or something like that, um, it is zoned R4. Uh, the council has indicated that uh, mixed use housing, higher density housing, affordable housing are all things that might inure to the public good. 
Uh, the mere fact that a department indicates that, in their opinion, they believe that uh, they would like to hang on to this right of way is not dispositive or binding in any way upon the council. I think it's, I think you recognize it, and then you make your decision. John, <clears throat> uh, if I'm not mistaken, uh, Dennis, you said that there is no build, there's no house there now, and if there is no house there now. I would think that most anything that went in, as long as it fits within the uh, rules of an R4 neighborhood, would be uh, for the public good. Um, and uh, versus a lot that has nothing on it, and it's probably not very well maintained. So. Uh, I would, I would probably have to say I'm, for this and the other reasons that were brought out, that I'm in favor of this particular uh, project. Okay, Catherine, you had he answered my question actually. Oh, he's already. Okay. I'm done. Mr. John already answered. Okay. Mm -hmm. Art, I was just going to say I'm really torn on this one because I can see. The greater public good is articulated by the applicant of enhancing density and still putting up something nice, but without any assurances, we're out floating in the breeze here a bit and unable, in my mind, I am having trouble determining is this within the public good or not, and I feel like I don't have enough information to be able to determine that at this time. So I, I would absolutely agree with Councilman Bedke. I feel like there's just not enough concrete here to. Well, that's make this that. Decision. That being said, folks, guess what? We're going to make a decision. So, <laughs> well, in that uh, so case, that for, with that, why okay. Art? I would uh, move to uh, deny the uh, application for the right of way vacation. I will second that. Okay, we have a motion by Art and a second by Gina to deny the vacation of this piece of property. And I will start to roll with John. No. Yes. No. No. Yes. No. Okay, well, it does not pass then. So the vacation will be denied. Is well, that no, correct? Right. Or no. Other way. No. The motion fails. The motion failed. Sorry, folks. Sorry, I got it up. <laughs> Been a long night for me listening <laughs> to all this stuff. Okay, so with that motion denied. So to deny the motion has been no. Okay, uh, floor so is open John. for a new motion. Yep, exactly. I would then move that we uh, accept the uh, right of way vacation on uh, the piece of property that we've been discussing. Second. Okay, we've got a motion by John and a second by Catherine to approve this vacation. Got it right that time. I'll start with Walter. Aye. No. Aye. Aye. No. Aye. Okay. And the vacation is granted four to two. Thank you very much. The problem this we'll move on to the next thing. We need to do the ordinance. Yes, we do. That's the first thing. Uh, we need to read so the we, ordinance. Yep. The next thing is the ordinance, so we will need a motion. Oh. You need a motion yep. to pass the ordinance. To pass the ordinance. So that's the second part of it. The first part was done. John? Uh, you need a motion? Yes. Uh, yeah, I would make a motion that we pass the ordinance. Second. Excuse me. John, do, we, or do you intend Maybe. that it be uh, presented on first reading under waiver of the rules? Oh, rule? yes. Oh, yeah, yeah. So if I'm you just read the action right, right it, now, would... but yes, <laughs> <laughs> I, I do. Uh, Approve the ordinance under suspension of the rules requiring three complete and separate readings and that it be read by title and published by summary. Second. Okay, we've got a motion by John and a second by Catherine to approve this ordinance under the suspension of the rules requiring three complete and separate readings. I'll start to roll with Walter. Aye. 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 Okay, and this is Ordinance 2017 
Two. 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 Okay. Ordinance uh, 2017-02, an ordinance of the City of Moscow, a municipal corporation of the state of Idaho, providing for the vacation <laughs> of a portion of public right-of-way located within the City of Moscow and legally, legally described in Section 1 of this ordinance, providing that the title to the said uh, vacated right-of-way shall vest with the owners of the property as specified in Section 3 of this ordinance, and providing that this ordinance shall be in full force and effect from and after an approval publication according to law. With that, we will move on to number seven, which is friendly and diverse community resolution. Gary? Thank you, Your Honor. Uh, what you have before you tonight is a resolution that uh, has been discussed over the past couple of weeks by the city council. Uh, the mayor approached uh, the council president, council vice president, about uh, considering a resolution reiterating and affirming uh, the welcoming nature of Moscow as a community and that uh, resolution uh, loosely based on some, a resolution that was considered and passed by the Boise City Council uh, in a similar vein. Uh, in putting the resolution together, um, it was discussed at committee. Uh, the things that were taken into account were uh, the previous actions of the City Council in particular, um, and I think very descriptive of uh, the welcoming nature of Moscow is uh, Title 10, Chapter 19 of our City Code, uh, titled Non-Discrimination in Employ Employment and Housing Practices, an ordinance that was considered and passed in 2006 and then amended in 2013. Uh, this ordinance prohibits discrimination on any prohibited classification, uh, gender identity, so on and so forth, uh, to make sure that citizens in Moscow uh, were treated equally, no matter what their um, orientations or their uh, race, creed, etc. So based upon that, uh, we crafted the resolution to uh, look at that, look at the diversity of the community, uh, the proclamations by the city council and the mayor over the years in support of uh, <clears throat> diversity and in support of uh, the University of Idaho and the various student programs, so on and so forth. So based upon that, Your Honor, uh, you have before you a draft resolution, again, that was considered by both committees of the city council and we were directed to bring that resolution before council tonight for consideration. Okay, and, and there's a paragraph in here that I want to read to folks. And even though <clears throat> this is not a public hearing, I am going to take public testimony on this for those folks that want to speak to us tonight. Um, and this is kind of it in a nutshell, that the city of Moscow is committed to being a friendly and diverse city where all residents feel welcome safe, and able to fully participate in and contribute to our city's economic and social life. And we urge all residents of Moscow to do their part in reaching out and welcoming all those who live and visit in our community. Um, we are a diverse community. Uh, we are a diverse city. We can lead, be a, a force, in my view, as a leadership role for the state of Idaho for what we're doing here. This is exactly what we are and who we are right now. And so with me and, and uh, staff did a great job of putting this together. This was something that I asked for a number of weeks ago. This hasn't been something that has just propped up the last couple of weeks. And so I'm excited to discuss this and talk about it because, uh, well, we all love this committee. So with that, I'd like to, Gary, listen to some of the folks here and see what they have to say about it. And Thank you, Your Honor. Have them come up and introduce themselves, tell us who they are, and talk for a few minutes. Let us know what you think. Come on up, Joanne. Uh, good evening. I'm Joanne Manita, 203 South Howard. First of all, I can't say I couldn't be more proud of our city, our mayor and our city council for considering uh, a resolution affirming our welcoming and friendliness. Um, I was sorry that uh, I've been ill and I didn't know if you took testimony at the committee's uh, hearing before this or not, but I um, had a few suggestions, if I could pass this out. Hmm. 
Yeah. Thanks, Joanne. Can we have one for the city clerk as well for the official record? I got some extra ones here too, Joanne. There was, you gave me two if you want to need another one. My reason in, in proposing this is just to slightly strengthen the uh, th three of the things that are involved. One is the safety and legal protection of everyone, whether or not they're citizens. And we're seeing these days the uh, spread of fear and uncertainty, which no one should have to live with, and especially not in our friendly community. And I think um, incorporating these words in the first phrase uh, would strengthen that part of the commitment of the city. And the second part, um, I know we don't want to be a sanctuary city, but I do think we want to point out that we're not going to use local resources to investigate or detain people unless it is federally required, not requested. So those are my suggestions, and uh, hopefully you can consider them. But I do, um, as I say, applaud the, the thought and the uh, intent of having this resolution. Thank, Thank you. you, Joanne. Oh, I want to do want to mention something that we've received all kinds of emails and different uh, information from various folks throughout our, com uh, our community on this. I just wanted to share that as well. Victoria Seaver, 121 North Lily, Moscow. When people are oppressed or in duress and seeking refuge, or even simply trying to get a chance to better their lives, the proper response is to welcome them with what we can, to act with kindness, and to offer hope and inclusiveness. If America is the great and powerful nation it proclaims itself to be to the whole world, then it is strong enough, it is fair enough, and it is open enough to reach out its hand and heart to others. It is not only our police and military and officials who protect and serve all people within our communities, but we too, the citizens in a society who stand on the behalf of others. We cannot expect either law or legislation to, gu to guarantee absolutely to eliminate any threat or to somehow enforce a zero risk ex existence for us. It's just not realistic in any context. Compassion is a surer and saner path than reactionary fear that would resort, or resort to discrimination or persecution. So I applaud the mayor and the city council for extending this welcome and for having the solid faith in our community that this resolution affirms. We choose to extend a hand in friendship and to build mutually beneficial relationships with those who would come to our city. Some of the first words we teach our children are please, thank you, and you're welcome. Please pass this resolution with pride and substance. Thank you for initiating it and carrying it forward. And to those who would grace our home here, you are welcome. Thank you. <clears throat> Well said. Hi, my name is Kate Evans. I live at 117 South Monroe Street. Um, I uh, just joined the faculty of the um, University of Idaho College of Law to um, teach immigration law and direct the well, immigration Well, welcome clinic. to our community. <laughs> Thank you. I've greatly enjoyed it so far. Um, I apologize for my boy voice, but I was um, late to the game on this, um, but really excited to see the council moving forward um, and uh, in line with everything that I understand Moscow to be. 
you right now. Um, I just wanted to talk about the number of students that are coming to my office and the number of emails that I'm getting from professors, staff, students concerned about the environment right now and their exposure. Um, which you know is is detracting from their experience at, at uh, the school and and teaching. Um, I've also had a great uh, working relationship with the court system so far and the city attorneys um, who do a wonderful job of highlighting issues associated with immigration in the um, criminal justice system. And so I think many of the things that are going on are good to continue. Um, and I would just. I, I, reinforce um, the fact that that a, a statement that is specifically um, directed to individuals regardless of citizenship I think is a very welcome one right now especially since Moscow um, police uh, have the, the the arrest and detaining responsibilities on the University of Idaho um, and so that uh, a, a restriction on the use of county and or on city um, facilities to detain individuals based on um, federal civil immigration violations um, in excess of what would be required under <clears throat> Idaho state law for an Idaho violation um, would be a wonderful addition to this uh, to this resolution and in line actually with the um, bill that was just introduced in the House legislature as well um, to, to make clear that um, there's no obligation on law enforcement to hold or detain a person beyond what is warranted by the probable cause found for the violation of laws under the state of Idaho rather than detaining people um, at the request on a civil violation. Thank you. Ms. Evans, would you come up? Uh, we've got one counsel that I'd like to ask you a question, Kevin. Sure. Can you bring up the, the piece that I've been, we've been talking about this for a while. Mm -hmm. And um, Gary mentioned, you know, it's Chapter 10, Section 19 in the code. And in the, our city code. In our city okay. code. In this part, and I wish we could bring this up because it's E, it's D, E, and F. The, and it's under um, the police regulation piece. Okay. Okay. So. The code already addresses what's being asked, which is no obligation on law enforcement. And the code reads that in F that um, people are protected. It says the, pro the prohibitions against discriminatory acts as provided for in this chapter are intended to supplement state and federal civil rights laws and regulations prohibiting discrimination in the areas of employment public accommodations and housing housing therefore this chapter shall not apply to complaints alleging to discrimination based on or prescribed under state and federal law and it talks about you know color religious uh, creed ancestry and stuff so the protection that's being requested to me in trying to understand this is already stated in our code <clears throat> Well, no, it's well not. one of the things that we looked at, and Gary might be able to explain this a little bit better, but when we came up with this resolution, we've already got a discrimination ordinance in our code here in Moscow. And so when we came up with a resolution, we didn't feel like it was necessary to restate all those things. Gary, would you like to elaborate on that for a moment? Yeah. Again, the <clears throat> charge that staff was given was to look at our past practices and things that we've done. Uh, things that have been passed by the city council that um, evidence the council's commitment to uh, fair treatment, so on and so forth. And uh, the code section they have before you is is a great um, reflection of that. Looking at the discussions that had occurred back when this ordinance was passed had to do with a pretty far-reaching uh, discussion about everything from gender identity to religion, so on and so forth. And the common theme that ran through it was that uh, that was not going to be tolerated in Moscow, that uh, the council wanted to make a statement that as far as housing, employment, uh, access to public facilities, that the council wanted to make sure that there was no discrimination uh, that was going to be brooked by the city council. Uh, with respect to the individual rights of folks as well. And the council felt that it did, went as far as it could at that time uh, to encourage that sort of diversity and anti-discrimination. Uh, so uh, 
what we were instructed to do and what we did was to look at um, ways to put into a resolution the welcoming nature of the city uh, with its policies and in light of the diversity of the community. So that's what we did. And to remind us all just exactly what we are and who we are, <clears throat> we want people to be able to prosper uh, with whatever it is that they do lawfully in our town and um, get along with each other and make this community vibrant like it is and continue to be vibrant, whether it's now or 10 years from now or 50 years from now. And that's the whole goal behind this. Yeah, and I, I guess in, in response to, to the councilwoman's question, I, I don't read that, that section as being directly um, controlling the detention policies mm -hmm. of the of the police department and so the way that this arises although I don't think it's common practice but here but it's I think maybe an increasingly one increasingly common practice um, uh, going forward in at least in other jurisdictions is for there to be requests to hold individuals for 48 hours based on um, alleged federal civil violations mm -hmm. that would exceed any detention that would be um, required uh, uh, as a result of a violation of Idaho state law. And so that was what this language, that, that was what the Joanne's um, strengthening um, suggestion goes to, is the notion that the city resources would not be dedicated to detaining individuals in Moscow for additional periods of time based only on allegations of federal civil violations. Okay, so the, so the sorry, Mr. Reese is okay. What's that? Can I ask a question again? Sure, you can ask another question. Is that okay? So it has to do with with this part right here. Is like, so this has been the police part that we're grappling with, mm -hmm. which had to do with whether or not they are citizens, right? That's that's the phrasing that's wanting to be added to the resolution that we've been discussing. And what what we're trying to do as a municipality is is maintain what we can do as a municipality in terms of enforcement or non enforcement so I think that the um, it looks to me as though there were sort of two two areas of, of potential suggestions for additions which is the first paragraph which was the addition of the citizens or not citizens mm -hmm. piece of things I think that whether whether or not that says citizens or non-citizens mm -hmm. may matter for you know the how it is taken by individuals in the community um, where I see the actual implications in the experience that individuals have is in that last paragraph and the suggestion there of making clear that um, city resources will not be dedicated to detaining individuals based or investigating federal civil violations. That's a, uh, when we get into this, I'm going to ask the two lawyers over there, and I don't want to get into a legal uh, briefing other than one thing I want to make very clear to everybody is that we want a town to prosper, and how we prosper is welcoming basically anybody that can get here that wants to work and prosper and be productive in what they do. And that's what we're looking at. It's just it's a human right that we look at. That's how I see it. Now, I'm clearly not an attorney, but I would be extremely disappointed if we had a bunch of officers zooming around this town just looking for whoever looks different than the rest of us, whatever that may mean. Uh, now, if you, but I made this statement. If you drive through town 50 miles an hour, we don't care who you are. We're going to stop and give you a ticket. Rod... Uh, well, I can address you, some of that. Our law enforcement has never went around and did a stop and asked for, to see somebody's papers without lawful cause. The only time they ever ask somebody for their identification is if there's, uh, they can articulate that a reasonable suspicion of a crime has been committed. They don't go up there and say, you look different, I need to see the papers. And I don't think we would ever allow that to happen. There would be no reason for that. When somebody does get arrested for a lawful reason and they do end up in the jail system, 
Usually they get the fingerprints rolled at that point, and the FDA, or actually the ICE, would take a hit on that, and then they make a request to the court to hold them. That's usually how somebody gets caught up in the system here. But our law enforcement does not go voluntarily look for somebody who may be here illegally to detain them to see what their status is. And that detention piece at the request of ICE is what the suggestion is getting to, is that's typically how individuals, based on some interaction with police, end up, a call is made to request that that individual is held, and held only based on federal civil violations rather than Idaho state law violations. Thank you, Ms. Evans. I'd like to hear from other folks out there that would like to come up and speak to us as well. David Pierce, 716 East Death Street. I thought about writing something to deal with this, but listening to what we've already said, I couldn't have written what I want to say. Because what's already been said makes me realize some other things. We don't need this resolution. The city of Moscow does not need this resolution. Latah County probably does not need this resolution, although it might. Who needs this resolution is our legislators and 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue, Washington, D.C. We are telling the world that we believe in equality. That's what's important in the long run. We're one of all these other sets of people who are saying what's happening is wrong. And we want you to know that we feel that way, too. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> and Dr. Pearson, and, you know, the important thing about this, and it's one of the things I stated earlier when I started talking about this, we want to set a leadership role. We get it here in Moscow. You're absolutely right. And do we need this resolution? It could be yes or no, but the thing of it is we need to remind ourselves and remind others if we're going to lead the charge on this thing, and we can get it done. So thank you for those comments. Here comes Dr. <laughs> Pierce again. <to get> some. <laughs> and I didn't, I didn't say the piece that I wanted in there, but I'm glad we did it. <laughs> don't need it, but I'm glad we did it because it tells the world. Yeah. Mm. Thank you again. Interesting times we're living in, isn't it, folks? Others like to come up and speak? John. You had I would, at this point, I don't see anybody else moving up to the microphone. I would... Uh, John, can I make a question before you do that, if I may? Yeah, hang on a second. Walter? Gary. Sir. We had a typo-corrected, I guess, resolution passed out to us. Yes, it was just removal of a couple of comments, some punctu okay. simple I, punctuation. I just want to make sure which one we might be making some kind of a motion on to, or not. It's, yeah, However, it, the this one is the one that was before committees. The one in tonight's packet had a couple of words added, I think possibly by art in yep. administrative. Yep. The one you passed out doesn't have oh. and visitors in it. Right, you are. If that's the case, I apologize for that. Let's go back to I the... I want to make sure we know what we're dealing with here. Okay. So if you look at the one in the packet, uh -huh. and in the paragraph following, now therefore be it resolved, in the second line of that paragraph where it starts, and visitors feel welcomed, comma, safe, comma, and able to fully participate in, comma, that is one of the commas that would be deleted, and contribute to comma, that is the second comma that would be deleted, okay. and the balance of the one that was in your packet would be the same. You also deleted end visitors in the one on the paper as opposed to what's on the packet. Yeah, he was just reading from the packet. Yep. Right. I was. Right. So can we just say ditch the two commas but then leave it as... Yes, exactly. Yeah. That's what... <laughs> Thank okay. you for... Uh, All right. 
getting to the cutting to the chase. Jim, that's and what and I meant. Visitors to do. are very important. <laughs> okay. We, so, John, uh, I would move that we um, pass this resolution in its amended form. Other than that, as it is written. <clears throat> okay. Second. Okay. So just to be clear, what yep. appears in the packet with the two commas removed as yes. opposed to what's on the piece yes. of paper? The motion was to approve the resolution that was in the packet, less the two commas. Indeed. I was terrible at grammar. Terrible. I was okay. the comma remover. And that was my email. Sorry. <laughs> got a teacher here who's helping me out. I'm, okay, I'll start to roll with Walter. Aye. 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 Okay, unanimous. Thank you very much, folks. This is an important thing for us. And yes, we are very much, this is Moscow. This is Laytaw County. But boy, we need to spread the word out there too, don't we? We got a few out there that, well, they can't, I can't, I can, well, I can't say what I write, David, because it wouldn't be quite right. And it wouldn't be good in the newspaper for me to say what I think, come bluntly about it. But we'll move. Without it, you know what? We're going to take a five minute recess. It's nine o'clock. Let's recess for five minutes so we got a bathroom break and then we'll come back. Eight, nine. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Yeah. <laughs>
Okay. Zach, you got the microphones on? All right, we're rolling. We're ready to go. Welcome back to our meeting. We will go to item number eight, which is Moscow's Farmers Market Strategic Planning Research and Recommendations by Jen Pefner. Good Jen, evening. How welcome. are you? Um, thank you. So there's several items uh, we're going to cover this evening. First and foremost, the um, Farmers Market Commission has undergone a strategic planning process, much like the City of Moscow strategic planning process. And that really has given us uh, the foundation to then do some review and analysis to give some better information um, or to um, lay the foundation for a recommendation regarding fees that the council has requested. So take you through the planning process first, a little review and analysis of how we got to our recommendation, and then, of course, the recommendation would follow. As noted, the strategic planning process that the City of Moscow underwent uh, started with looking at uh, some of the good things that are going on, and we looked at the farmer's market value in that same aspect. Uh, one of the things that was completed over the summer as part of the, um, or the strategic planning process was an economic impact report completed by Stephen Peterson at the University of Idaho. Gave us some economic drivers that uh, were determined through the market. We've got both conservative and, and a bit more liberal estimates there looking at items such as jobs, anywhere from 94 to 128 jobs that the market creates, um, how that relates to salary payments, uh, the annual vid visitor spending, excuse me, 4.1 million up to 8.2 million. Um, some of the visitor numbers as well, and these are hard numbers, these are snapshots in time, um, 84,000 in 2003 and 164,000 in 2013. That could have been a rainy versus a sunny day, could have been a couple different factors there, but we think we're definitely seeing some growth over the years. And then the overall economic impact was estimated at either 3.94 conservatively or the 5.46 on the upper end there. So putting some, some numbers to um, the generation that we thought the market was uh, helping us create in the economic sense, um, which has helped us look forward at, okay, what's the value um, in both the economic and the social aspects. When we look at the social side of it, our community branding project that we engaged with the Chamber of Commerce and the University of Idaho noted that one of the top three things that people recognize about Moscow are the University of Idaho, the farmer's market, and then our sense of place or um, with arts events, our uh, sense of occlusion. Our resolution spoke to that this evening as well. Um, but farmer's market is definitely one of the top three that people recognize Moscow for Moscow. Uh, and also, our farmer's market has won awards time and again. We're the oldest market in Idaho. We um, got the number one market in the state of Idaho for the sixth year in a row, and we're one of the top 15 farmer's markets in the nation. So all speaks to that social and that economic side and how important those two are uh, to us in the market. So when we uh, started with our strategic planning, taking that value into, into consideration, the commission um, focused very much like the city of Moscow did, looking at the driving forces and trends that are going on, this, the market as an economic driver, service delivery in the market, and the market's role in that place making, that sense of Moscow and, and who we are. Uh, this document also was the first, we believe, that put together a more comprehensive history of the market and the accomplishments over the years. Uh, and that's actually the bulk of the document. And it's nice to have all of that in one place now. That was quite an endeavor. So that's exciting to have that checked off the list. Those desired legacies also fueled, um, well, were fueled by the mission and values of the farmer's market, and these were in place. The commission had done an excellent job of uh, establishing these prior and reconfirmed their commitment to them, specifically the values of access um, to produce um, for community members, economic opportunity, community, and information. So all those things that, again, make the farmer's market what it is um, and were important to the commission to maintain and enhance. And then this is my, my caveat. This is the market's not broken. There's nothing, nothing overtly wrong with it. We just know there's things that we need to be ready to proactively address as we move forward. So that was one of the toughest things for our strategic planning effort is looking, okay, what's out there that we do need to address? They came up with five major challenge areas. Um, and we called them all challenge areas because there were five and we could be pretty succinct in outlining those. Specifically, uh, or excuse me, none of these are in any specific priority. So I'll just go through them one at a time here. Advisory and operational expectations are unclear and lack boundaries. This is really establishing uh, between staff and the commission how we can best serve the commission as staff so that they can make their recommendations to council and so on. 
um, talking about the planning tools that we want to put in place for them and that they feel would be um, helpful for them. Strategic planning, of course, is um, a key driver in that, and we'll continue working with them on reporting and letting them know how we move forward um, in addressing the goals. One of the specific pieces uh, that we had as well are staff performance measures and deliverables with timelines so that we can stick to the course and make sure that we're getting that information so that they can do the planning to make the recommendations and so forth. An item you'll see here shortly this evening is um, the market integrity and it's uh, the potential for threatening, uh, being threatened by a lack of clear policies. Each year there's an annual update of policies that um, began seven or eight years ago, I think now. So that's newer to the market. It's not something that's been there all along. But looking at how we can increase the clarity, the quality, um, the education, um, all of those things and how policies apply to vendors. And so they're more aware of what they're getting into and we can uh, make that process a little bit smoother for all the vendors. So this one in particular speaks to the research that we'll talk about in a moment regarding a fee recommendation, uh, looking specifically at the equity and the efficiency of the allocation of costs of the market. We have several different types of vendors. We have several um, between season and walk-on, um, a lot of moving parts there. And so breaking that down and doing some good research on it so we can provide uh, the background and the foundation for both the commission and council to make decisions um, is important to us and we feel that staff can provide that information. Um, a couple of the things we've done so far is the initial research and turn, or, uh, submitted the information to the commission, which has helped us develop the recommendations to bring to you tonight. Um, let's see here. Immediate and severe infrastructure needs. This speaks directly to the city of Moscow's goal, talking about aging downtown infrastructure. It ties in uh, very well. The idea here is to outline the concerns that the market has in regards to infrastructure downtown. Um, really so that if there's a potential for a grant or something else that may come up, we have all the information prepared and we can show the need. Um, and also to look at planning for future and how can we address those needs that we have as we move forward. Looking at market layout um, and the restrictions there, really the market layout at this time, we've been at on Main Street since 2013. Um, we know there's a lot of potential there. We're just not sure where that potential should go, and we want to be able to give the commission the information they need to make those decisions, and that's really what this, this issue, issue surrounds. Um, so we'll be looking at different research um, and different information that we can provide so that the commission can make those uh, decisions and recommendations. So all the planning brought us to the next stage where we needed to review and analyze some information to provide a recommendation on fees. That was one of the first tasks outlined in the strategic plan and has been a specific focus of the commission over the last bit here. I'll talk uh, just quickly about the 2016 market um, since we haven't given you the year-end update on that as, as of yet, so we'll get hit some of those highlights. A lot of the programs that have been in place previously continued with the um, addition of a few new ones. Um, listed here is kind of the laundry list of all the things you might see at the market. Anything from high five programming where you have little kids tasting vegetables they've never seen or dealt with before. Um, the Backyard Harvest has been a mainstay at the market for quite some time now. They accept the SNAP and EBT benefits. Uh, bike maintenance, uh, Palouse Paws, a couple of markets where the, um, kids could visit with pets and pet them and, and check them out. Uh, just a whole host of things that we've been able to do that um, the arts department has facilitated over the years and have continued. So, And then this was implemented um, as part of the City of Moscow strategic planning process, the day data sheet, and it's really just a snapshot on that day at the market as to things that went on. Um, you'll see things called out such as whether sunny or 75, who was the band playing, um, several issues cropped up, you know, what kinds of things are going on so that we can go back and say, okay, what's a, an issue that we're seeing over and over and over again that we need to address? Or what's just something that happens occasionally that's not a major concern? So that information and data gathering is going on regularly now. Sales reports have also been in place for several years now. We, this is an overview of the sales reports received to date. Uh, we had a couple of different types of vendors that were added in 2015 that are now reporting. Um, and so you can see how those numbers have grown over the years as uh, we believe with the reporting, people are reporting more often and we have more vendors reporting. Um, but we're continuing to collect that information and to work with vendors to get those sales reports in. 
And then this is an important thing to note happened at the market this last year. Idaho, or excuse me, our market was one of the first <coughs> in Idaho to accept these uh, few Washington <coughs> benefits, actually. Idaho benefits that aren't currently available to farmers markets, but Washington has extended that to our area. So these aren't full year totals, and that's specifically the fresh bucks, the women and infants, or the WIC women and infant children, and then a Washington Seniors Farmer Market Nutrition Program. So um, those amounts uh, will probably go up in the next year as we'll have a full year under our belt, or full season under our belt. The SNAP benefits up top have um, continued to um, stay steady, and we're excited about that. And in addition, there were about 470 pounds of food collected at the market that went to backyard harvest um, and various food banks. So um, that's a wonderful program we have as well. So then we took a little bit deeper dive into the historic costs of the market. Um, what we've done in years past is looked at the other departments that um, I would say contribute resources to the market. We went one step further and looked at the arts department budget specifically and did an estimate of market costs versus art costs, which are the two main functions of that department. So the arts department costs that we estimate are dedicated to the market are the first row there. The other department costs are the figures you've seen, such as police, fire, water, uh, those types of things, um, other ancillary services, parks and rec, uh, which gives us a total market cost on line three <coughs> that range from 112000 in 2013 up to 114000 in 2016. Below that, we have the vendor fee revenue ranging from 33000 to 46000 and that's uh, the differences there come from additional vendors. There were a couple of fee increases along the way. Um, the, there was one in 2012, um, but as that was on in the Jackson Street parking lot, we did just the 13 to 16 to do the Main Street comparison. Uh, looking at the percentage of fees versus the total market costs gave us that vendor percentage, and it's ranged from 30% to 41 uh, that was one of the items we wanted to look at to make sure that the vendor fees were keeping pace with market costs, and so it was nice to see that that was actually happening and actually increasing along the way a bit. Uh, and then they balanced the city percentage there. Then we've got an average fee increase along the bottom. As I mentioned, there was another 3% in 2012, and then the 3% in 14, the 5% in 15 leading to 16. Um, we say an estimate or an average there because there's very there's quite a few steps within the fee structure, and so there wasn't a 5% across the board. Some fees were increased, some were created. There was a new electrical or a corner space, something like that, a new fee was implemented, but it did bring the fees up. So given that information, we came to the conclusion um, that we'd like to make a few recommendations. Um, the first is uh, no fee adjustments at this time. As I mentioned, the vendor fee portion of uh, costs has stayed steady and increased over the years, in fact. Uh, the second item that was pertinent to that uh, recommendation is the cost of the restrooms to maintain over the summer. Talked with Parks and Rec, and they have a budgeted figure of $857. And given that that was a fairly modest amount, we felt we could uh, had capacity within the budget to manage that. Uh, specifically, the commission would like to look at a multi-year fee structure um, recommendation for vendors so that they'll have maybe a five-year scope out as to what vendor or what fees could be doing. Um, and staff is um, committed to being able to pull that together, that information together for commission review and recommendation to council in advance of the FY18 budget. So see that information around July of this year um, if uh, accepted. The other piece that we looked at is now that we've really uh, looked specifically at the market operations costs and whatnot, um, recommending the hiring of an interim full-time market manager, and that would begin March 1 through September 30th, so just through the end of the fiscal year, not the end of the market. Uh, we have two things that are going on there. We've got a grant that is being pursued to hopefully help cover those costs, but given that it would be interim um, and for much of the, the budget year so far, we haven't incurred the cost for a full-time manager. The estimated additional cost would be about $4,947. So... Um, we also, between operating contingency and the just capacity within the budget, have the flexibility to, to manage that, we feel. So some of the things we've completed, that analysis of past history, um, putting together a proposal for the commission that they were then um, willing to forward to you this evening. They did adopt their strategic plan on February 8th, their last commission meeting, and they'll continue working under that. Um, and then you have vendor guidelines and policy documents, which you'll see in a moment. So those are we're starting to check off those performance deliverables right away, which is um, feels pretty good. So 
Next steps, as I mentioned, research and submit. It would be what we're referring it to it as as an allocation model to capture and represent stakeholders. And the that would be their vendor fees, the city subsidy, all those types of things to kind of capture a big picture of the economic and the social value of the market. And to do that by July of 17 in advance of the 18 budget. And then to develop a multi-year plan and approach to fees um, to begin in the 18 market season, which would be the FY18 fiscal year budget. So with that, are there any questions? You have the liaison to farmer's market this year. <coughs> <laughs> yeah, they've really worked hard on this strategic plan and uh, <laughs> and put a lot of time in it, the commission has. And uh, I was really surprised at how low the Parks and Rec estimates the uh, maintenance and operation of the new downtown restroom was going to be as a piece of this. And I, I kind of expected there'd be some sort of fee increase associated with that, but since it's less than a thousand dollars then it's not um, I, don't, I don't think it's really relevant and as Jen says there's money in there's flexibility in the budget to cover that and uh, I think they decided that because uh, if you're going to raise fees you should have some rational basis to do so based on data and not just well we should go up because we think it needs to go up um, that that maybe that's the, the way to approach it and then when as the next budget year comes up and we have data that can support some sort of fee increase uh, and a graduated fee increase over a period of years that that would be the best way to approach it. Walter? Uh, Jim, there was a heading in there on one of the slides that the market layout is unsafe. <coughs> um, <clears throat> I'll play attorney here with Rod and Gary's <laughs> smiles. My client just <laughs> tripped in the market. And my lawsuit's going to quote that because the city's already said this market's unsafe and it's been that <coughs> way for two years since the council approved this uh, document and they hadn't done anything about it. I would defer to the attorneys <laughs> on that one. You're going to sue because it's well. unsafe, Walter? Is that what you said? I'm sorry? Did, I, I didn't quite get that. You yeah. said you said, I said, I said I'm insane. an attorney for he fell down and hurt himself. He falls in the market. Oh. And I'm filing a lawsuit against the city. I'm going to use this document to prove the city knew it and did nothing about it. Now, Gary, I'm using the attorney analogy just to make the point. <coughs> but what about the market is unsafe? I mean, it is a public street appropriated by the city for the use of a farmer's market. It has infrastructure that we are aware is as it is 24 hours a day, 365 days a year. I, I guess I just have a problem with stating the market is unsafe. I mean, we, we, we have the fire department check to make sure the tents are weighted so they don't blow off in a certain length amount of wind. We don't allow guy wires to string out across the street. We don't. We, we, we this, that, and the other, and then you put 6,000 people in there. Yeah, if I, if I may. Go ahead, Gary. Um, attorneys can do whatever they want to do. If, uh, <laughs> certainly. I said it's just a, making a point. I've had, I've sued a few governments in my life, and, and they do things like this. Every time we put a grant in, we say that uh, the street in front of the middle school is unsafe. We need a grant to help us with that. If some child was crossing the street and got injured while that grant is pending or if we didn't get the grant, certainly you've got the city council's opinion that that could be safer. And that's the way we couch it in terms of it's not Main Street isn't built as a farmer's market plaza. It's built as a Main Street that happens to have a farmer's market on it. So you're talking about fire regulations, sanitation regulations. One of the things that we're looking at right now is the, the aggregate crosswalks need to be changed out. They've got pits in them. Certainly, is that unsafe? Yes. Um, we've got, we've come back several times with grants uh, for ADA um, ramps up to our intersections. Are they unsafe? Absolutely, or we wouldn't be trying to, to swap them out. So I understand your point. I don't think it takes away at all from this. I don't think it's going to be any... Uh, windfall to a litigant that they can point at a plan that the city's trying to improve its infrastructure and say, see, they knew it was unsafe and didn't do anything about it. Then if I may follow, 
then why not say it that way? Why not say that the market and, – and, and, and the word layout puzzles me. You know, mm. if, if it's the layout, it's not the crosswalks. No. It's not the cracks in the stride walk. It's not the curbs that people might step off of. The verbiage you've got in there says layout. I don't, I, I don't make that connection. Is there, there's another way to say it, to say that it needs improvement that has been recognized as – needing improvement or something like that, as opposed to the outright statement that the layout is unsafe. That's all. Well, and I don't, I don't want to belabor it. Again, if I may. We've been here a while. One of the reasons that we do that, um, and you'll notice in our city strategic plan, we put it in terms of is this a problem and don't sugarcoat it. Say it's a problem so we can deal with it. Uh, one of the reasons that's written the way it is is we expect to ask for some grant funding. And whether it's economic development funding, whether it's CDBG funding, or whether it's transportation funding, in order to make that a better venue. So you want to put it out there that, yes, the council recognizes that it's not as safe as it could be, so give us funding. And I wouldn't, I wouldn't be concerned about the liability issue just on this blanket statement of it's, you know, it's not safe. I think you'd have to articulate what particular part is unsafe that caused any harm. Gina. Okay, guys. As a former commission trooper in the trenches with you, I applaud the baby you just had. It had to be just as painful. What a great, great, um, thorough, deliberate articulation of what we were working on those first couple weeks when we couldn't agree with anything. We couldn't even be in the same room together at that point. So thank you for the work. A volunteer commission, thank you. Um, if I, if, are we ready? I would love to make a motion that we maintain the current fee levels for 2017 market season and approve hiring an interim full-time market manager from March 1, 2017 to September 30, 2017. Second. Okay, we got a motion by Gina and a second by Catherine to maintain the current fee levels for the 2017 market season and approve the hiring of the intern full-time market manager from March 1st, 2017 to September 30th, 2017. Well, Walter. Thank you, Mayor. Um, I, I'll vote yes for this, but only because hey. of the commitment in the document <laughs> to look at the fee structure for the 2018 budget and to uh, I, I don't agree with Council Member Boland that any thought of raising the farmers' market fees is, is – I don't remember your exact words, Jim, but it's, it's not just because. There are reasons for it. So, But I'll, I'll vote in favor of the motion. Okay. Okay. <laughs> Start to roll with John. <clears throat> aye. 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 And aye. Okay. Thank you very much for the strategic market the strategic planning research recommendations. Thank you. Jen, and we will move on to item number nine, which is a Moscow Farmer Market 2017 policy update by Kathleen Burns. <laughs> Your Honor, oh, if I may. Yes. If I could just make a comment about uh, appreciate uh, uh, Aaron Carroll's leadership as uh, oh. the chair of the Farmer's Market Commission, the commissioners, and Jen's work on this. The Farmer's Market, it's a great uh, – a, a great activity every year. It's a little bit disorganized. Uh, Kathleen is uh, just a great events person, and I think bringing it full circle and uh, producing a business plan and this strategic plan, I think, will make all the difference in the world. So thanks to Kathleen and her work on it as well, and uh, we'll move forward with it and get you some uh, fees ready to go for the 18 budget. Okay, Kathleen. Okay, so now for the boring stuff. This is, <laughs> and it's really not that boring, but we're going to end the night with policies. <laughs> so, <laughs> policies. <laughs> well, um, so every year uh, we review the policies, and um, Rod's here because I work with Rod on the policies. And I just want to um, clarify that these are some of the updates that we've been discussing with the commission, by the way. 
and um, this is another revision of these policies, but let's start with page two of nine. Uh, we clarified no wholesale or resale products of any kind. Um, page four of nine, cleanliness. Um, we mentioned under cleanliness the violation of market policies and subject to penalties as stated in appendix four. And the reason why we did this is we really emphasize that um, you bring it in, you take it out. So we don't want to take garbage from the vendors. We want them to take their garbage with us, with them. Page four of nine, number seven, didn't have a title. And we're going to add the title violations. And that will be in reference to appendix four as well. Um, page six of nine, non-attendance which is an issue if we have a vendor space and we are assuming a vendor is going to be there and they don't call to let us know they're not going to be there, this is a violation. And again, we reference Appendix 4. Page 7 of 9, A and B, definitions. Um, we worked really hard on this with the commission, um, defining um, a seasoned vendor and a walk-on vendor. And this was really important to put this in policy. Um, Page seven of nine, this is a new one that was brought through with the commission, and that's um, utilizing local ingredients and posting the source of local ingredients. Um, this is also page seven of nine F, on-site prepared food list, use of local ingredients, and post source. And these two items, C and F of seven and nine, is very important. We are a farmer's market. We have a lot of produce. We want our vendors that are preparing prepared food on site to look at the, the produce that's in the market versus to sourcing from a Sedesco truck, a Charlie's produce truck, or a Winco. If carrots are in the market, they can source in the market. And this is becoming a, um, a standard um, in most markets in the U.S. So that's why we, the commission talked about this a lot and we added it this year. Page eight of nine, um, prepared food at market must use compostable tableware. We had a waste audit this summer. Um, they presented on the waste audit. It's time to go to compostables. The um, city has been using compostable tableware at our picnics, at different functions here at City Hall. The price point has gone down for compostable tableware. I think it's time to put it in the market. And then page eight of nine, we defined a forager. Um, and that's someone with either mushrooms or huckleberries or um, different products. And so we put that in there as well. So questions. I know it's a lot to absorb, but you have the physical copy and then these are the bullets. You know, I'll make a comment, Kathleen. I uh -huh. Gary had said this just a little bit ago before you started your presentation. And, you know, with the commission, the policy changes and the different things that we're seeing is really well written, I think, personally. I think, it's, it gives, I think it gives us a great uh, direction to go, and I think the commission needs to be commended for it. I think the, they've done a great job on it. Yep, a lot That's of hard work. Oh, I see it. Yep. And remember, your commission has three vendor seats mm -hmm. on the commission. So it's really important that the vendors that are on the commission weighed in on this as well. Yeah, absolutely. Yep. Questions for Kathleen, anybody? Move we approve the recommendation of the policy changes as stated for the 2017 Moscow Farmers Market season. Second. Okay, we have a motion by Catherine and a second by Jeannie to approve the recommendations of the policy changes as stated for the 2017 Moscow's Farmer Market season. I'll start the roll with Walter. Aye. 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 Hey, thank you very much. And you know that ends our regular meeting, and I would um, <laughs> suggest, being it's a late night, that we have our reports at the next council meeting and look for an adjournment tonight. I have one one thing, Mr. Mayor, that I'd like to say, though, is that uh, Jazz Festival will be, will be hosting a, an event in this room, a brown bag lunch, noon tomorrow. And I'll be here. Dr. Skinner will be here to talk, and uh, 
Aaron Mayhew and uh, the new jazz festival uh, on-site guy. And uh, so anybody that's interested in that should come to that. I'm planning on coming to you. You'll be here then. Good. Do I have a motion? Adjourn? So adjourn. moved. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? We are out of here, folks, at 937. Thank you all very much.